So welcome everybody to our session on real-time payments. Uh, like this is being spearheaded by Godfrey and Ishtvan. They're both active members of the MIFOS and Finteract and MojoLoop communities. So Ishtvan is gonna focus on some of the efforts that MIFOS has been helping to lead around the payment hub to provide uh, engine to integrate with real-time payment systems, focus initially around MojoLoop and then Godfrey is really going to focus on the emergence of real-time payment systems around the world, the guiding principles of the Level 1 project, and touch on MojoLoop. So I'll pass it on to them, but this is a very you know, interesting and pertinent topic as we believe aligning Finteract as an open source account management along with an open source payment system like MojoLoop can really power a full end-to-end -end architecture for financial services. So really looking forward to getting more of our Finerac community involved with the open source community around real-time payments and hope this can be a launch pad for that. So thank you, Ishvan and Godfrey for taking time to lead the presentation today. Looking forward to it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ed. And uh, yeah, welcome everybody on the call. It has been quite a, an exciting session from the beginning. And uh, in this session, really what we're going to be liking to do here is really to incorporate much of what has been discussed and, and wrap it up in terms of you know where real-time payments can help us connect all the disparate efforts that we, we have within the, the financial ecosystem. So what I'll do is I'll, I'll be the, the first one to introduce and uh, I'll, I'll, I'll run with a couple of slides and I'll hand over to Isvan later. Just for quick introduction of both, uh, I'm based in South Africa. And uh, my, my focus is really consulting in the fintech space and I've been a contributor of you know, some of the real-time payment initiatives such as uh, Mojaloop and Mowali. Started with Mowali from, from inception when I was actually doing consulting at MTN. Been part of the MTN Mobile Money Group and I've uh, rolled out mobile money in 14 countries in Africa. And, and that's where in my interest really and in participation in open source project deepened because I've accessed in terms of, you know, how much we need to do to, to close much of the gap in that space. So I'll just quickly go on to the agenda for the day. I'm not sure if my slide will be changing. Let me know, uh, Isvan. Is, is it changing? Hopefully, Sorry, hopefully, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so okay, that's no, fine. So, okay, perfect. So, basically, what, what we'd like to do, we'd like to compress this into two sessions. And the real, the first session is really for, for me to position where real time payments are uh, in today's world, but starting a little bit by making sure that we, we've got common definition of it and we've got common understanding of what are, are, are real time payments and what are the key benefits that we, we have with real-time payments in terms of looking at the current cash society and converting it slowly into a more reliable you know, model of offering services to, to the poor. So I'll touch a little bit in terms of the, the inside and the outside of real-time payments. And I'll spend a, a large degree of my time really looking at what, what we see as the biggest accelerators of real time real time payments with reference to what you know level one a uh, uh, project foundation is doing which is actually billion million the case you know funded and as well as the resultant you know product of level one initiative which is moja loop you know around building a highly interoperable and a very inclusive scheme that is meant to really connect all the, the disparate system. And, and thereafter, I'll hand over for Isvan to really take us through the experience that we have with MIFOS integrated into Finerac, as well as Mojaloop as a live implementation that anybody can tap into right now. Just quickly for a quick introduction of MIFOS, I think much of the audience, you've already been introduced to this. It really, you know, the, the, uh, the idea of, you know, you know, open source for good 
is much more kind of like uh, prevalent today. And MIFOS has really positioned itself, you know, from the beginning at the center of much of what activities is happening. And at this point in time, I would say, if you look at the Finarek community, if you look at the Mojo Loop community and more other communities, we're slowly collapsing and we're slowly looking at common use cases. And that is really uh, what has been driving the MUFOS openness uh, uh, DNA, wherein we want to touch base with anything else that is expecting outside our space, and we want to make sure that we are focused on the, the key use cases that can really, really advance financial inclusion. Going a little bit in terms of the end-to-end the -end stack, and you know, you might have seen this you know, from a different view, but uh, this has actually evolved from you know, just focusing on the account base from a first perspective to, to really be the glue between what we see as the, the rules and the rails world, which is where the real-time payment sits, as well as the accounts and the app world. And, and Mifos is really strongly positioned itself as a kind of like a glue between all the components, but very, very important. We're not even, you know, you know very specific to any specific uh, solutions or technology. We're just using in this instance, Moja Loop as a, as a real-time pay, payment system example. And as well as on the app, we've got kind of like open, flexible APIs that really can expand into either the app that you adopt in our stack or any other app in that world. So what really this ecosystem does is bringing in very slowly the glue that is needed amongst all the different disparate uh, post projects that we've been talking about in the open source digital landscape. Moving a little bit forward, just to very specific to, to try and you know, give a very basic kind of like definition of this. You know, the, the, the clearest part of this is when we talk about real-time payments from a service perspective, from what the end user feels, it will be something that will look like cash, wherein if you give it to somebody, if you send it today, it gets received today, it gets cleared immediately, and it goes even beyond the, the, the parameters where cash doesn't go, wherein it supports various models, and you can send this payment via various channel. And a quick example of what will that look like and, and why should we, we look at this as a service to the end user is really to you know, better the ecosystem. The, the current cash ecosystem has limitation that you can only send it within certain geographic boundaries and you can only send it in one model. With real-time digital payment service, we'll be able to send you know, near real time. And, and, and there's a lot of definition of what that is means. And in most cases, you know, Isven and I were talking about it and say, what, what we mean by real time clearing? And in most competitive market, we can say the highest we can think of, it is about 30 seconds. It has to be less than 30 seconds. Certain countries are even defining it to the point that it has to happen within a couple of seconds, five seconds. But for the mobile money platform, which is one of the, the biggest example of real time you know service it that happened within sub seconds just depending on the network jitters and everything else and with this type of a setup we are able to enable you know people to send money to their children for studies or to pay for for merchants or bills or even to to go to the doctor where you need an intervention now and if you go to a service provider and you still need to tell him that the money is still hooked up somewhere in the card network, you'll come later on, you will not be able to receive service. So this is how really the real-time payments are connected to improving the lives of society and, and really solving you know, the problem of financial inclusion at its root. And going a little bit in terms of you know, what, what, are, what are this ecosystem built of? So what I've done here is really to to show you the, the infrastructure element and the rail element, and as well as the, the consumable element that is facing the users. And, and, and typically this is the stack that we, we actually took from a, a financial services for the poor, wherein they define it in two areas, which are really distinctly categorized as the, the infrastructure slash rule area, which is made predominantly the collaboration space across you know, various entities, as well as the competition space, which is really where most kind of like a commercial entities, commercial interest will jump in and provide the services. And also in terms of 
what we have seen in the market, you know, the frontiers of, of, of the, the app space and the account space has been predominantly mobile money operators who have actually done very well in making so that within their own ecosystem, they provide the service as real time as possible across all the different services they offer, whether it be merchant payments, person to person, you know, you know, transfer. They've done very well in really being consistent and also with the help of GSMA is helping that space to really be driven on common standards that can be you know, adhered by all. And also on the switch side, which is really you know, the engine room where money is actually being moved from one party to another. This is where the settlement happens, you know, after a day or two, after the clearing has happened on the top layer. This is where, you know, Isven has mentioned from his experience with faster payment and as well as I was part of the, the, the Mowali kind of like implementation. So this is really where, you know, much of the intervention from Moja Loop sits and, and a whole lot of other kind of like commercial players in the real time you know, processing space. This is a processing space and the in the in the consumerable space in terms of the layout. Just moving to one step in terms of just trying to you know aggregate this for, for the sake of time, I'm just trying to put this in one slide and 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 at very high level and aggregate what is re really needed as the key challenges for us to confront. And as you know, money you know movement through cash has been with us for over over decades. You know, it started, you know, in, in 1664 with the Bank of England when the first bank service was introduced. And today is still, you know, part of over 60% of the cash movement in most developing countries. And, and really here is what people are used to. So when you talk about a cash as a service, this is really what people are used to. It is, it is really immediate to them, it's irrevocable and very important it is you know, accessible to all, everybody can have cash, there are no rules around that. And also from a kind of like a acceptability of payments, it is ac accepted by all. So that is actually a base foundation which a real-time payment service needs to address. So if we equate cash on those four elements, then we've got the, the, the right you know, starting point to be able to go and, and then slowly reduce you know the reliance on cash with real-time digital payments and going further it will be to look at the opportunities and the opportunities that digital payments brings in to really negate all the shortfalls of cash you know from security you know fraud and corruption in the sense that there's no kind of like a you know level of knowing who's moving cash twist there is kind of like a, a large degree of anonymity in the cash space and as well as transparency and accountability you know in terms of the usage of funds especially from public entities and from a central bank perspective and as well as from you know financial accounting perspective there's very little we could do to have a view of the cash moving so the amount of time it takes to do financial reporting on the cash flows it takes you know months and months for central bank to aggregate that so th those are the the real benefits that we will derive from negating the shortcoming of cash. And, and different stakeholders have different interests in, in all those. And moving beyond just resolving those is really to bring in an innovation, you know, powered by the digital, you know, means that we're using. So if we look at user experience, you know, through the apps and the USSD channel from a mobile money perspective, really that is actually a space for us to accelerate and actually buy more acceptance from the from the users of the of the real time system so it also you know addressing an, a, a question of inclusiveness of the ecosystem this is really a real game changer and a cornerstone because as long as you are you playing in the digital financial services space you can play a part as part of the ecosystem members and even beyond a uh, local boundaries which is a country specific solution now we can safely say we will be able to build this network of real-time payment system beyond one border. So we, we can have, you know, two, you know, you know, you know, regional banks talking together. And in case of Africa, where regional banks are shared based on the same currency, this really can be a real game changer on a very, very large space. And in some of the research that we have seen is the fact that should we move away from a cash model? 
you know, there will be much more improvement from a GDP perspective. I mean, this is quite, you know, you know, you know, thoughtful for emerging countries to actually all gain up to three percent of the GDP cross just from moving from a cash-based society. So really, the challenges are solvable. There's nothing on the challenge that we can't solve. It is just the the, the models that we put together and the stakeholder engagement that we need to do to resolve those challenges and move forward and fast forward and, and create a more openness society to be able to solve this thing together. Just to quickly move on to what I've picked up as the trends in this space, really, this is actually kickstarted in the mid 2014, 2015. And to date, as you can see the, the map, that there have been lots of uh, initiative from central bank and commercial entities around building the backbone of the system, building a real-time you know, payment you know, backbone network infrastructure, getting the rules in place and the scheme so that you know, more players can come on top, be it banks, you know, non-banks as well as third-party payment providers can come on top and really accelerate the penetration of these real-time payments. And India is actually one of the, the example wherein to date they're doing over 1.6 billion transactions per month, which is which is one of the most kind of like used. And part of those transactions is really, you know, harnessing and also hovering over the, 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 the card network. They take from largely banks and card network and they bring it into this ecosystem that they've built, which is actually very, very successful model that anybody, any country in the world can really you know, take from. And in terms of the countries that are doing this, we're looking at about 70 countries, they have it live. And in the next two years, we've got 40 more in the planning space across the globe and time. Quickly switching over to, yes, we've seen the, the global market trends, you know, what people are doing all over, but we're looking at, at this point in time, what are the accelerators of this? And, and one of the the biggest accelerators of this is really an initiative that is being led by the Bill and Melinda Foundation, wherein they're looking at what are the extraordinary intervention to ensure that, you know, the population at large, especially in impoverished countries, can have a very fair access to digital financial means. And in there is really a, a set of rules and guiding principles for anybody to build kind of like a, an interoperable national payment system. And, and much of this is really done through an extensive research. So a lot has been done in the past. So uh, that, you know, success was actually incorporated into these principles to say, if anybody, be it a national central bank, be it kind of like a regional central bank or any financial institution with interest of creating an interoperable society, these are really the base building block that anybody can really reference. And what, what this really are, are made of is uh, there's a couple of principles that have been kind of like, you know, designed across all different areas from how do you go and create a scheme rule from the, the, the fraud and risk management, you know, mechanism you put into the design part. But I just wanted to take what I believe is the four key ones that are really the, the level one principles advocating from an open loop perspective, which is really very, 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 very core. Cool. Because in the past we had, you know, various financial services being categorized differently. So with this system is really to create an openness, whether is it licensed banks, you know, non-licensed banks, and everybody else that is participating at a country or a regional level can participate in this one, you know, uh, open loop system. And, and secondly, is really to promote the push-only real-time payments so that we can do this thing as risk-free as, as possible and also at, at the best available cost so that we avoid having to have, you know, batches of bulk payments processing running at night at central banks and so on. And, and very important and connected to, to, to the push payment mechanism is really just to make it same-day settlement make it irrevo irrevo irrevocable as, as, as possible so that it can actually be easier to run. And then very important and lastly, is really the rules around that, you know, the, the fact that everybody has a fair share in terms of contributing to the rules that govern the scheme, which is actually has the blessing of most of the central bank. And because this is really being put in front of everybody to look at, there is 
a reasonable degree of acceptance that we have witnessed with lots of engagement that James and the team at uh, uh, Financial Services for the Poor has been doing around this. So in closing, there are additional kind of like uh, design principles that have been put in there, but all in all, they work together to make sure that, you know, real-time payments, interoperability, interoperable systems are, are really available and affordable to, to serve the needs. And also in terms of the the use cases, there are a couple of key use cases that uh, has been fast track in many of the, the engagement that we do. And as you can see, one of the biggest use case connected to the mobile money perspective will be the P2P use cases. Ed, you're saying something? Sorry. Okay, let me just quickly move on. So in, in terms of where these principles are being applied, and this will be one of my last two slides, just to before I move over to Isven to really showcase, you know, from a from a payment hub perspective. Mowali is being one of the, the flagship and the, the blueprint implementation of this level one principle from an interoperability perspective and also looking at how best can this be done? How, how, how cheap can this be by providing it as an open source solutions for us to participate? Moali as a concept, we really build the building blocks that people will adopt. We, we don't create it as, as a service. So it will be up to the individual central banks and as well as the FinTech to adopt this as a free uh, for, for good open source software and run it on whatever scheme they can do. So compare with the world of the past, this will actually you know, be a game changer in the fact that we will be moving from systems that are not interoperable, systems that were bilateral, that takes time to, to really set up and rules that are actually meant for two, two or three parties to a really well-inclusive interoperability switch. And in terms of what we have actually done to date, you know, in terms of the functions that they are supported, this is really kind of like at a high level, the the what has been built, but a lot is really being pushed into what actually is connected to an interoperability switch. So we, we've got the main part of it is really P2P transfer and as well as the, the, the pay initiative initiative. So much of this is in a production ready stage and, and, and a little bit is really still in a kind of like a development stage as well as kind of like a testing phase. So just at a high level architectural view, this is really based on the, the, the initial P2P transfer, you know, using a mobile money native API as a start, and as well as a, a scheme adapter, which is an SDK, just to really adopt, you know, make sure that it's actually adopted much more easier for mobile money providers that can really support the, the bulk native API. This has really been running at Mowali as is, and uh, more and more services have been added to, to this overall architecture. But at the core of this is really an interledger protocol that sits in the hub. This is really where all the, the different uh, movements of money and the recording get kept, and as well as you know, a settlement and central reporting services attached to, to the central ledger. And in closing, and I, I just wanna make sure that you know, you, you'll have a very good basis to understand you know, what we're doing around the payment hub. So the, the payment hub is really an initiative that was done between MIFOS and Mojaloop to really close the gaps and be the clue between, you know, the accounts and the apps, as well as the rails and the apps. And much of what uh, Isven will take us through is to, to, to show that we've made much more progress in this. We've got it live in the lab and is ready for the MIFOS and funeral community to really go in and take advantage of it. And with that, I'll, I'll quickly you know, hand over to you, Isvan. Okay, thank you, Godfrey. Uh, it seems that we both of us like to talk a lot, so we need to be squeezed into the good. available uh, time slot, but let, let me try to go through this material. So you could uh, think that the payment hub was one bullet point on the list, but actually I break it up to a couple of that uh, ones. Uh, so what I'd like to talk about that, what is this? Then what type of architectural decisions or considerations we have done? Then how to deploy this whole solution? What processes we are already implemented and how to extend the whole system? Uh, how to utilize it with FINRA with the multi-tenancy capability, 
what additional control centers we built as part, what laboratory environment we have available, and a couple of ideas on the roadmaps uh, and what documentation and resources are available. Uh, so um, there is Ed, of course, probably everyone knows him. And there are a couple of us who were working on this project, uh, DPC Consulting, to bring this technology together with Christoph, Adam, Zoltan, uh, Zoltans, I would say. Uh, so that's, uh, we have built this payment hub. The concept is kind of, I could even say straightforward. Uh, what you need to do to transfer money from a digital financial service uh, provider, uh, a mechanism that you give an instruction, like one of the channels of the banks, that what you want to do, then a system who takes this instruction and orchestrates this whole process. Uh, obviously, you have some kind of account management system that the accounts are sitting, so you need to talk with that system. Then, potentially, you want to check that is this a fraudulent transaction before you sending out this uh, money. And then, ultimately, you go out to one of the payment schemas um, Sorry, that uh, you want to talk with um, and um, and get the response and like complete this transaction by actually booking the amount on the uh, transaction. The whole flow is supposed to take a couple of seconds, um, being it a real time uh, solution. What we have done, we built this uh, tool as a prototype first and now the second generation I would say ready for the enterprise to be used. Uh, technology is what we used. It's it's on a Java stack, Spring Boot and a couple of components are used. Probably one of the important ones is the CB uh, which sits in the middle of this solution. Now how to place this payment up into the big picture? So the big picture that you have some for example, module loop as the payment network, but clearly the idea that there could be multiple connectors here for different uh, networks. And then you are the DFSP or the bank or, or the one who wants to communicate and do real-time payments. You have some kind of channels, meaning mobile bank, ATMs or other systems. You have one or more of these account management systems, potentially some fraud monitoring system already, and then you're supposed to take this payment of what we have built, uh, deploy it to your environment. You could deploy on premises, you could deploy in the cloud, or you could have an aggregator to help with all of that. Uh, the, but the idea that in a fully blown solution, you have a couple of engines across multiple data centers, uh, which do the real time part of the flow, and all the data is collected to an operations uh, part of the application, which is, the payment operators of the institution are uh, dealing with and then capable to monitor what's going on in the systems. So that's the this complete solution is the payment of enterprise edition, which has these uh, different parts inside. Uh, now, what are the different parts inside? Uh, the I would say the heart is the ZB orchestration engine. Um, which is the stateful part of this solution, orchestrates that how the flows um, communicating with the different participants. The green niche boxes are the connectors or workers who communicate with the channels, with the payment schemas, and with the account management uh, implementations. Of course, you could deploy many of these uh, components connecting to multiple schemas, connecting to multiple account management systems. Uh, uh, what we have built is the Mojaloop connector uh, for the Mojaloop network and the Finera connector both for 1.x and for CN. Uh, and this could be extended easily. And below the heart, below the real-time engine, uh, you collect all this information somewhere, you put it to a Kibana kind of solution to show what's happening real time, but you could also, and we decided to push this to a long-term uh, data storage that the operators uh, could interact with um, and could take these transactions and could do certain actions with those uh, things like refunding the transaction if it was uh, done by mistake and identified uh, through other processes. So that's the idea 
that that how this payment of engine looks like um, internally now to get this together there were a couple of decisions i just want to go through them quickly one of them was that this needs to run on premises also we all love cloud but many of the financial institutions still have their data centers and they insist that they want uh, the system on premises so the bridge is like a kubernetes cluster that if they could provide that then our engine is capable to to run uh, another consideration was that there is a real-time part as i said and the operations backend is kind of a different beast and we could separate them um, in the whole solution uh, the real-time engine is kind of a self-contained highly available and fortran solution um, and we could have multiple of these real-time engines um, in really in a fully blown uh, solution. Uh, one of the things that we are orchestrating the flow that we need to handle timeouts and we need to correlate asynchronous events. Many of these solutions, including Module Loop and all the other uh, ones, either using messaging queues or even using HTTP protocol, but there are callbacks. So uh, it's actually an asynchronous event based mechanism. So we need to correlate all what is coming back from the in this case, the module hub. Um, and of course, errors could happen, um, need to act on them. Some schemas allows retries, others needs human interactions. That's what we need to cater for. Um, and obviously you want to see that what's going on in the system, uh, where are the money flowing and, and what, what happens. So you need that type of capabilities. Um, and for that statement, Jen, statement engine state machine makes sense um, and instead of relying on a relational database go for something that use consensus using rough protocol and using rocks db embedded for a key value store to manage these uh, states um, the idea also um, that one engine is typically put into a single data center and another real-time engine could be put in another data center again for a full-blown solution and the two engines could interact with each other as long as everything is fine but if one data center fails uh, then we still have um, at least half a capacity but we need to scale accordingly uh, but we are continuously available to handle the transactions yes the idea that with a full-blown solution you must do 24 by 7 uh, 4 5 9 ish availability um, including version upgrades and hardware replacement and so on and so on uh, if you really go for the enterprises uh, of course smaller players could could do less and that's what we also cater for. I will just mention a couple of uh, seconds later. Back office operations, yeah, that's the different part, uh, which could be detached, could be run separately, um, if, which has different availability requirements and tolerates um, outages uh, more easily. Uh, now, what we have uh, chosen to orchestrate these processes is an open source, uh, workflow engine or bpm an engine uh, that that is using raft using rocks db for state for storing the state of those processes and these are all replicated across the cluster um, and all the information that what happens is pushed out uh, via exporters that we could uh, uh, store and we could use for complete audit uh, trace what happened inside the system and for this engine who orchestrates the process we could have clients who are connected via uh, grpc and getting the task to execute a couple of ideas on this engine that you could use bpmn or yaml to provide the definition of the flows uh, there is visual representation of those ones um, and multiple clients can be used probably what is important because if this engine going to be used by the community and or system integrators that obviously the knowledge could be different with different languages uh, but that's the good point that having this engine uh, the different connectors to your own account management system or to the payment scheme uh, could be implemented in multiple languages uh, 
Okay, for Torrance, yes, horizontal scalability, that's also kind of important. Um, integrators, so the configuration for an integrator would be to redraw the BPMN flow, I would say. All the payment or all the DFSPs, all the banks would have some specialties. They have multiple different uh, account management system. They do have fraud detection or they do not have. Um, so the flows typically going to be different and the customization could happen easily with modifying this BPN model and just implementing the stateless connector to connect with the actual uh, systems uh, what is working. So the idea that for an integrator this whole payment hub is a tool that could be used quite easily um, to accommodate the re particular requirements of an implementation. A couple of ideas that is I believe important for the solution that we we need timers and those timers needs to survive failures uh, because we need to retry certain transactions in those given time frames. So that's something that uh, we could get from this uh, system. Uh, correlation of asynchronous messages that coming in, that's also an important uh, feature. If we have multiple real-time engines, then also important that the non-correlating cases to be handed over to the other engine, uh, depending on the uh, flow. and. Obviously, the failover situation handling is very important that, that how many nodes, how could they fail over, uh, what's the redundancy in the system. So that's uh, why we have uh, stick with this uh, solution. Now, deployment models, uh, based on all of this, that what could we do? We already know that on-premises and cloud is possible, but there's also a couple of other options. Um, and also what makes a difference that you are a tier one and two institution, so you need really the enterprise grade uh, solution um, and really like multiple data centers, or you are a smaller player um, satisfied with a less highly available uh, solution on a single computer or on a single node, for example. And uh, so the idea here that there is something that we call bare bone uh, implementation. It's I could say that this is for developers or for smaller institutions that into the single Kubernetes node, everything is a single node of these components. Functionality it's complete all it's working as required. Uh, obviously, the reliability and fault tolerance of the implementation is affected by this type of setup, but definitely saving costs and saving infrastructure and also on complexity, I would say. And we have two additional models uh, that the medium or fully scaled as we name them. Um, um, that's how you deploy the solution. Before jumping there, I would also say that there's another dimension of the deployment. Um, it can be yours, meaning that the bank or the DFSP is own, or uh, we could imagine a situation that an aggregator step up on the um, on the scene uh, on scene and calls the different DFSPs with a single payment hub uh, deployment. I will have some more details on this one. Uh, so the medium deployment, I would say, it's still a single Kubernetes cluster, but at least we have multiple nodes and all of the components are redundant and we have multiple instances of them connected to a cluster. Uh, ZB is the persistent one and also Kafka, which stores the, all the audit trace and all the logs, which is heading to the long-term uh, storage database. Uh, so that's, I would say a decent deployment with a, with a single uh, implementation. Obviously, if you need to replace all the hardware, all the operating systems uh, or update the components, this might not be really 24 by 7. But then if you really need that uh, type of a solution, then here's a fully blown uh, solution that from the real time engine, there are multiple independent setups. Uh, this also scales, uh, meaning handling more transactions, but it's also importantly um, um, uh, could support those cases, then you need to replace a complete uh, system. Now, 
supported process flows. I know that time is uh, tough here. So let me just go through that. For example, what you need an account registration process, uh, like a payer initiated transaction. So the peer to peer, tra peer to peer transaction or the request to pay kind of transactions. Then let's say a merchant initiates a request that please uh, pay me this and that amount. Uh, so a couple of diagrams here. I don't want to get into the details how a party identifier registration looks like in BPM. And this is the actual runtime model. So this is what the system is uh, actually executing. You just need the actual tasks who, who, who risk responsible for the individual boxes uh, to execute. Now, this is a bit bigger one. This is the payer process uh, with the necessary timeouts. Just want to highlight a couple of things. So if there is no response coming back, then you retry to a certain uh, amount of times after you gave up and you finished the transaction. Or another way that if you gave up and no response coming back, then you notify a human you notify a payment operator that we need to interact because we sent the money, but we don't know the result of that transaction. So we need to interact. We need to figure this out, get a report or, or get something and finalize the decision that we really received or, or sent the funds successfully or it failed. So we need to give it back to the customer so he can do another transaction with that amount. So that's kind of the concept. And now that this is the real time monitoring part, you see that there are transactions, there are these boxes, there are the process steps and times and variables, what you could see in the system. Now, this is the other part, the payee, then you receive what, you, what could happen with that one. Again, you could see that how it executes timings and and all the relevant information and then i can go on that there's the pay initiated flow as you see it's a bit different uh, because uh, it's like request to pay then if you accept this request to pay then you do a normal transfer so there's the sub task which is becomes a normal transfer in the process and then there's a payer fund transfer flow that how this goes through to the other side. Um, so that's kind of the ideas. Then I jump to the operational control center uh, part. So what does a payment operator see from all of these lovely processes? Um, on this control center, you log in, obviously. Uh, multiple tenants are supported as multiple DFSPs most probably going to insist that their data is segregated. So the archives also become segregated. Um, and then you can search for the transactions. You can do certain actions based on your privileges um, and um, and like refunding or or make a final decision on a particular transaction. Couple of screenshots from this application, how you search for incoming transactions, uh, how to search for outgoing transactions and so on and so on. Here's the screenshot that you see that the completed transaction take place at this time. At this time. Um, and the search fields, what you could uh, look for. Then here's the details, what happened with this transaction. And there are even additional details on the variables and the different timings and the exact process flow, what taken place. Uh, on the detail page, you could decide that you could initiate a refund transaction and then you could search for the refund transaction. So this is becomes a normal outgoing transaction that is uh, completed and that's roughly what you could see um, on on this control center so that's the user interface uh, for the uh, operators now there's another topic the multi-tenancy of this payment hub as we all know that Finract is already a multi-tenant uh, system capable to handle multiple dfsps with a single installation so the payment hub should follow uh, this lead and let um, users to have a single installation and providing multiple institutions. This is definitely important for smaller institutions, tier three and uh, four institutions, that simply aggregation saves a lot of cost, a lot of effort, and the technical uh, knowledge uh, could be also concentrated. Now, the idea here that there are two methods of this multi-tenancy. One, that you really go for an aggregator model 
uh, meaning an independent entity deploys the payment hub and then the different DFSP simply uh, take this as a service from the cloud or from uh, whatever solution uh, that's one model and the other one uh, that uh, the DFSP is already concentrated or aggregated let's say to a single Finerect instance which has multiple tenants inside then the payment hub could behave as multiple tenants for the payment networks uh, but internally it directs all the flows to the same Finerect instance just identifying the corresponding tenant so we build the capability that both of these uh, deployments are uh, supported and that's what we are using in our lab environment Regarding the lab environment, uh, what we have done, come up with um, a sandbox, which is up and running. And I would say logically what it does, it has Finerect CN and 1.x, the actual version. Then it has the payment hub in both of these deployments. Uh, all of the deployments having two different tenants, make sure that the whole solution supports multiple tenants. Um, and using this mechanism, you could already start transacting. Plus, what we done, um, added an API gateway and opened up some of the services from the open banking API. So the transact account uh, information, the account history, and the payment initiation services available here. So the customers uh, could log into a fintech, which access those tenants via these API gateways and could get account information or initiate a payment which goes to the payment hub and all these flows what I mentioned gets executed. So that's uh, what is there and uh, also in this lab environment we are trying to introduce new connectors like the mobile money adapter or or additional ways to connect to module loop or actually we are thinking about uh, getting the iso 20 or 22 adapter uh, that we have uh, quite a lot of uh, practice with in this lab environment what we are having free independent deployments um two mifos 1.x and one cn both of or all of them having uh, two DFSPs uh, deployed um, and they have a couple of accounts then transactions could go through there is one module loop instance to connect all of these six DFSPs together uh, plus we have an API gateway open banking APIs opened up and a simple really proof of concept fintech application uh, that could utilize those um this this environment plus the ci cd servers so the deployment could go quite smoothly uh, to this environment um access can be granted so if you join the my for slack um, and reach out to add me uh, then then we could uh, get some we could provide some access to all of these lovely computers what you see on the diagram uh, so so it's on azure environment um, and these are the free deployments, I would say. The, um, these are the tenants, the rhino and elephant, the buffalo and the lion and the leopard and gorilla tenants who exist in these systems. And um, there's the Finerect instance, there's the API gateway, and there's the payment hub itself, which is capable to connect all of these systems together with the module hub to, to communicate, which also deployed in this environment and then we have a fintech uh, to to test out the api uh, course now if you want to get deeper not today i believe then there's a there's a slide showing that what is inside the box uh, and as you see that we discussed finerac should we have um, um, microservice based um, solution as you see if you take a broader picture and you pull the API gateway, the open banking adapter, Finerac, the other components, and the payment hub with its own components. We the bank itself is already contains a lot of services which are stitched together to provide all of these services. Um, another initiative, one word on this that uh, there's an the module loop hub intends to introduce a new API that the third parties could interact. And one of these third parties who wish to to open up the solution is Google itself, uh, because then Google Pay could come and um, 
in those jurisdictions that Mojo Pump is available, uh, they could reach out to all the connected banks and get a payment initiated via their uh, application. Uh, so there are developments in this direction. A um, couple of ideas on the roadmap. Uh, bulk payments, it's still an interesting topic, despite we are talking about real-time payments all the time. Uh, performance tuning, what we have uh, started and or I would say even completed. Um, uh, Cross-network payments is an interesting topic. ISO 2022 support, uh, the PISP as I mentioned, um, and there's another concept called stand-in uh, that, that big institutions could play with. Uh, okay couple of ideas, bulk payment, in this case, we could do some pre-processing. Uh, so the bulk file could be received by the payment hub and could be split to either individual transactions or with the Mojo Loop, they also support some kind of batches, but you need to pre-process, you need to identify the target DFSPs and one bulk for one target DFSP. Um, stand in two words about this, that the capability that if your core banking is unavailable, but you still want to at least receive funds from other institutions, probably that's very important, uh, especially for larger institutions. Um, and we all know that these core bankings uh, require some downtimes. Even as we discussed with FINARC 1.x, certain transactions could not go while the batch processes are running. Uh, so, so in this case, we could apply a stand-in system who's capable to receive those incoming funds. And whenever the core bank becomes available, pass it on uh, to update the accounts. The more sophisticated way that the stand-in is capable to handle outgoing transactions and stand-in um, instead of the core bank, but that requires a bit more complicated synchronization and obviously some risk of overdraft uh, comes into the picture. Um, Performance tuning, um, we have uh, done uh, an extensive test on the system that like driving it from Gmeter, uh, see that how the workflow instances are uh, increasing. So you see that that we pushed a couple of minutes, uh, 100,000 uh, transactions over the system. Um, so um, the response time is pretty decent. The processing latency is quite uh, good. Um, it depends on how we model the solution. Um, we could say that uh, with a normal setup, we can go up to 250, um, let's say transactions per second, but then we need to check these BPM and flows at what exactly we might mean by that. Uh, so, but, but definitely there was a lot of effort and all of this effort is documented on the resources page. So in Git book, there's a documentation. It's all, all there, uh, accessible. So you see that the, the overall documents, what I just presented, uh, plus also the tuning and performance is added recently uh, to the deck that how to approach this. Yeah. Thank you very much for your uh, interest and thank you very much for the uh, for for listening.